Ads and Sales, a study of advertising and selling from the standpoint of the new principles of scientific management by Herbert Newton Casson. Chapter 3, A Sales Campaign, How to Start It. Just as the Lusitania and the Singer Tower and the Brooklyn Bridges were planned by experts and architects, so a sales campaign should be planned by experts and architects. It should be structural. At least as much attention should be given to the selling of an article as was given to the inventing and manufacturing of it. No great achievement, and certainly not the winning of an indifferent public, can be done without a plan. This is one of the most important principles of efficiency. To present an article to the public in the right way, by the right name and at the right time, requires skill and forethought of the highest degree. This may seem to be kindergarten talk, but kindergarten talk is necessary in the case of many corporations. Four-fifths of our selling is still of the slam-bang, hit-or-miss species. Its main aim is usually speed, as though it were better to do a thing wrongly today than to do it rightly in six months. There is seldom a plan that is worthy of the name. The three main points to be considered are, one, the article itself, two, the possible buyers, and three, the general trade conditions. The name, in the first place, may make or mar the sale. One tobacco company and one biscuit company recently put out new articles with a big blaze of advertising before they found out that the articles had been given names that were already copyrighted by other dealers. The appearance of the article must be studied, as the superintendent of the factory has seldom an eye for good looks. Then there are the labels, usually of the plainest and most uninteresting sort. All these are the dress in which the new article appears, and they go far to determine whether or not it receives a welcome. The buyers are of two classes, the dead sures and the possibles. The former need little or no notice. They will come without calling. It is the possible buyer who needs all the care and attention and advertising. For instance, a set of ten books was recently published containing the famous Brady photographs of the Civil War. Uh, such a set of books would not need to be advertised among the war veterans. Every veteran who could afford the price could be counted on as a dead sure buyer. And the people who should be aimed at in such a case are the younger men and women. <laughs> have to be invented to suit the case. For example, when the McCormick Reaper was launched, a very complete sales system was developed. It had six main points. One, a written guarantee that the Reaper would cut an acre and a half an hour and not scatter the grain. Two, a fixed price. Three, a responsible agent at every competitive point four publicity five the goodwill of customers mccormick made it widely known in his early days that he never sued a farmer and six public competitions with rival manufacturers which introduced a very valuable vaudeville element into the campaign 
This sales plan is well worthy of notice, as it captured the trade of the world for McCormick. All told, the McCormick factories have made and sold six million harvesters since McCormick invented the first one in 1831. The telephone business in New York City was dwarfed for years because it had no suitable sales plan. There was a flat rate system of charging, and no one could have a telephone who could not afford $240 a year. Then, in 1896, U.N. Bethel worked out the message rate system, and the business shot up to be eight times as big in ten years. This is one of the best cases on record of a good article being held back by a bad method of selling. Both the telephone and the telegraph were illustrations of this fact, that the approval of scientists has a little value in the business world. One word from Morgan or Frick is worth a whole book from Heckel. Both Morse and Bell wasted much time in giving demonstrations before scientific societies without any commercial result. In the end, both the telegraph and the telephone were taken up and marketed by men who knew nothing of science, but who did know a great deal about sales. In the case of the Standard Oil Company, we have an illustration of remarkable success and equally remarkable failure in the development of a sales plan. From the first, the Standard had one fixed idea, cut out the middleman. In this way, it could make the best possible oil and sell it for a very low price. But as the Standard has found to its sorrow, the aforementioned middlemen had a most undue amount of influence with the legislatures and judges. These middlemen did know, and the Standard did not know, the value of publicity. Even Mr. Rockefeller himself has now an inkling of the cause of the trouble, as he said recently, quote, I have often wondered if the criticism which has centered upon us did not come from the fact that we were perhaps the first to work out the problem of direct selling on a broad scale, close quote. There is no good reason why direct selling should make a corporation unpopular. Direct selling means lower prices, better goods, and quicker deliveries. It means a straight track from factory to buyer. But the public does not know this. It is suspicious of any corporation that controls or monopolizes a product. And the standard made the fatal mistake of not taking the public into its confidence. It did not know in its earlier days that people are people, not wooden images nor economic units. The master salesman of the world, Andrew Carnegie, was the first to work out a real sales plan on a large scale. What he did was so stupendous that few people have realized it. Very likely two or three generations will have to pass before the genius of Carnegie looms up in its true size. The fact is that seven short years before Carnegie sold out, his company was capitalized at 25 millions. Several years afterward, he offered to sell out to his partners for a hundred millions. This was before he himself had realized the importance of first creating demand when offering a property for sale. Then the mighty Rockefeller came to him and offered to buy his plant. This woke up the Carnegieian brain, which never at any time dozed very heavily. He sprang to the head of his 45,000 men and set a-going such a series of maneuvers as the business world had never seen and never wants to see again. He made war on his competitors until they ran to Morgan for help. He was at that time making one quarter of all the Bessemer steel and one half of all the structural steel, but he began to build new plants and bigger ones. He commenced a tube mill at Connaught to fight the tube trust, and a railway of his own from New York to Pittsburgh to fight the Pennsylvania Railroad. He ordered seven new ore ships to compete with Rockefeller, 
almost every hour some new bulletin of war came from his office what was the result carnegie sold out and at a price that broke all records the mere interest on his bonds gave him a pension of fifteen millions a year for life taking stock and all he received four hundred and fifty millions he had capitalized every man in his employ at ten thousand dollars apiece the buyers paid this incredible sum cheerfully they paid it with a hurrah as morgan once told carnegie they would have paid fifty millions more if carnegie had asked for it and what they got was not the whole carnegie company the main asset of the company carnegie himself was not included in the bargain this climax of salesmanship shows that the main thing in selling is to make people want to buy a selling atmosphere must be created no one wants fans when the thermometer is below zero or umbrellas on a sunny day in july the conditions must be suitable or else the best of goods may not sell for twenty cents on the dollar it is said that the chinese when their roads get worse strengthen their carts the idea never occurs to them to mend the road so a manufacturer when sales conditions are bad will try to keep business up by hiring salesmen who are more competent and more expensive in many cases he would get better results by spending the extra money on the conditions instead of on the salesman for example 